but so, so this is an interest that I hope I hope to, to build on after my PhD. Anyway, uh, last year I fumbled on some new data on inequality in the Caribbean. And it appears that, and the data goes back from 1960 to 20, 2013. Now, since 1960 to 2013, inequality has remained entrenched. And by inequality, I mean top income shares, top 10%, top 1%, top 5%. Save and except for countries like Belize, Jamaica, and I uh, can't recall the other one. Inequality decline in those countries primarily because of what, I, what I'm arguing, exogenous shocks like hurricanes and so forth. So if we get new data in the future, we should expect uh, volatility in inequality data given the, the recent hurricanes. Now, so there's high inequality in the Caribbean and of course in the world we know given Piketty and so forth. Now, an interesting thing about the Caribbean is that it's one of the major recipients of remittances in the world. Now, I, I fumbled on the call for paper for this Ghana conference here and it occurred to me that there might be a connection between remittances and inequality. Now, I looked at the literature on remittances and growth, and it's inconclusive. In some cases, you see remittances increases economic growth. In some cases, it reduces economic growth. There, there are some other studies, not many, on how remittances affect inequality, and the measure of inequality in this case is the Gini coefficient, right? And once again, that too is inconclusive. There aren't much theoretical work, however, on the connection between uh, remittances and inequality. I hope to make some contribution in this direction and hopefully at the end of the presentation I can explain why the literature is inconclusive, why we find in some cases remittances is growth intensive, in other cases it is not. So this is not a theoret this is not an empirical paper in any sense, there is some mathematics and so forth, but it, it should be very simple. Now the argument, the story is very simple. I'm arguing that Remittances are important determinants of the functional income distribution. So we're not dealing with top income shares, we're not dealing with Gini coefficients, we're not dealing with TL index. We're dealing with profit share, we're dealing with wage share. Now of course, if you read Piketty or go back to Marx and the classical thinkers, there's strong theoretical argument and recently empirical support for how functional income distribution can lead to personal income distribution. So we can deal with Gini, we can deal with uh, top income shares and the like. Right? So this paper does not get into that. It focuses exclusively on the functional income distribution. Now, I'm arguing that the channel is the labor supply decision. So in some countries, you will find that remittances increase the functional income distribution or wage share, and it might decrease the functional income distribution. And I'm arguing that has to do with the labor choice. Now, given the ambiguous relationship between remittances and the functional income distribution, we must expect, therefore, an ambiguous relationship between remittances and economic growth. Obviously, therefore, I'm arguing there is a connection between distribution and growth, and there's lots of theoretical work, lots of empirical work uh, in that direction. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept of wage and profit-led growth. I'll say a bit more about it when we, when we get into that. It's, it's a largely a post-Keynesian analytical concept. Uh, anyway, so here we go. This is the basic work leisure setup. Very simple. Labor has a choice. Work. Uh, and by work, I mean wage employment or leisure. Now, in the paper, I do extend the choice. So you have wage employment, self-employment, and leisure. But for this presentation, we're just going to focus on wage employment versus leisure. Now, what we have here is this is leisure, which is the difference between the total time endowment and hours work. And this is a basic utility function, income, and leisure hours. We have the basic budget constraint. And this is where the story is. So we have labor income being the sum of wage income from wage employment, and V, which is non-labor income. In this particular case, I'm interested in remittances as an important source of non-labor income. Yeah? And, we, and I basically want to understand how will this non-labor income remittances affect the labor choice decision. And I make a connection between that and the functional income distribution. And then finally, between that and growth. Now this is the basic Lagrangian. Everything else is basic as what, what we're familiar with. Yeah? I have here, if leisure is a normal good, we have the labor force inversely related to non-labor income, where the reverse holds. Now, we have a firm, we have a simple uh, production technology where the firm combines labor hours with intermediate inputs to produce output Q. Output Q can be exported or consumed domestically. And then we have the price and decision of the firm, which is basically a markup over unit labor costs and intermediate inputs. Note that in the price and decision here, 
have E, which is normal exchange rate. So we're dealing with a small open economy, which fits the Caribbean and some other countries in Europe and even in, in Africa. Yeah? Now, this is the markup. The markup can be determined by a number of factors. Uh, the traditional literature talks about a degree of monopoly, but it can also be determined by public policy. So the markup basically recommends, represents sorry, the strength of the bargaining power of employers, so to speak, and public policy, whether it's for unions or against unions, can certainly affect the bargaining power of employers, and that would be represented by the markup. Yeah. Now, uh, I have the cost of intermediate inputs. This is some cost of domestic capital and imported capital. Now, I have here the firm's investment function. Now, this is important because later on I want to make a connection between distribution and growth. All right? So the firm's inve investment function is a basic post-Keynes investment function. Should, I mean, forget, forgive the term post-Keynes. All this is saying is investment at the firm level is a function of level profitability or profit shares, capacity utilization or aggregate demand, and this is animal spirits in the traditional terminology or business confidence, if you will. Now, the goods market equilibrium, I'm gonna, now gonna, gonna focus on the role of government, though I will talk about the role of government. If we do include the role of government, the central findings do not change. I'm going to assume only profit income is saved to simplify the analysis. If we assume that some wages are saved, that does not change the, the outcome. So we have an aggregate uh, savings function where savings uh, comes from profits, so as total profits rise, total savings rise. Then we have a current account uh, equation where the trade balance, or the, sorry, the trade balance, the current account balance is a function of domestic aggregate demand, foreign aggregate demand, net unilateral transfers to account for uh, remittance inflow or capital flows, and this is simply the real exchange rate. Right? So what we have is the labor supply decision of the individual, individual worker, if you will, potential worker. So they choose to work either in self-employment or wage employment, or they choose not to work. And then we have here the firm's pricing strategy, which is a markup over total variable cost, if you will. Then we have an investment function and a savings function. And then we talk about the openness of the economy. So the goods market equilibrium, forgive me, the goods market equilibrium is basically where we have savings equal to the trade balance plus the aggregate savings function. This is the basic IS curve, if you will, which is this implicit solution here. All right? Now, basic, very elementary Keynesian stability condition is how does the economy uh, adjust to excess demand. So if there's excess demand, meaning investment and the current account balance exceeds aggregate demand, how does the capacity utilization or aggregate demand change? What we're showing here, this is a necessary condition for short-run stability. If aggregate demand increases in, in, in the given economy, we expect a deterioration in the trade balance. This is the basic income effect, so to speak. And then we have here, if aggregate demand were to increase, we expect excess demand to be eliminated as there's more leakage out of savings and there's increases in trade balance or investment. So all I've done here is to show that we can, with a simple economy, very abstract, I get that, how we can achieve basic goods market st st uh, stable equilibrium. All right, that's the first thing. Now, we're going to get very briefly the wage-led and profit-led story. So a wage-led demand regime is if wage share increases, aggregate demand increases in the given economy. It could be, and this, the empirical literature is divided, you find some countries are wage-led or profit-led. And by profit-led, we mean if wage share increases, aggregate demand falls. That's basically what it is. Or you can have the same story for profit-led or wage-led growth, where if the wage share increases, growth expands, that's wage-led. If the wage share increases, growth declines, that's profit-led. All right, now I, I hope to show that this, these regimes are key to explain why the literature is inconclusive. All right? Now we get to the functional income distribution story and remittances. So very simple, we have aggregate income being the sum of wages, where H is the sum of hours work in the total economy, and this is aggregate profits. All right? Now aggregate profits can be defined as total prices minus total costs, where this is the cost of intermediate inputs. All right? Now, this, this was a price for the individual firm. If we aggregate that, we can say that this is aggregate price level equal to this here. So if we substitute these two into this equation nine, we get this as aggregate income. 
the sum of aggregate wage share, aggregate wage, wage bill, forgive me, and the sum of the level of profit. Now, if we divide this by the wage bill, if we divide both sides by WH and take the inverse, we get the aggregate wage share. Now, the aggregate wage share here is saying that if aggregate hours work in the economy rises, the wage share rises. If labor productivity rises, the wage share rises, and the same holds for hourly wage. But the wage share is inversely related to the level of the market or intermediate input costs. All right, so we can have, we can, we can tell, we can tell a story here about bargaining power between what this markup means. This markup, as I said, illustrates the bargaining power of the firm. So there's a bargaining story here. There's a class conflict story, if you will, over this wage share. But there's also one that talks about hours work. Now we can actually, we can rewrite this in terms of time endowment. So where T would be aggregate time endowment in, in the overall economy, total leisure hours available in the economy. And what we see here is that remittances must affect the approval. So as long as, sorry, so as long as remittances affect the leisure choice, it will affect the wage share. What does this mean then for countries that are major recipients of inequality? I can, I can speak definitively for the Caribbean. Now, I'm from South America, Guyana, but we speak English. So culturally, we're Caribbean, and we have an economic uh, arrangement with the Caribbean. Now, if you visit the Caribbean or Guyana, Limers, is this term meaningful? A, a limer, a loiter? There are lots of loiters, lots of limers in the Caribbean space or in Guyana. Yeah? So in a sense, these guys are not necessarily unemployed. They're even unemployed. They're just chilling. I mean, it may, it may be difficult to imagine for some of you. I, I understand that. But from the space where I'm from, this is, this is normal. You know, how do you explain this reality? And I think remittances is a big part of this story. All right? Anyway, so... I have, I have three theorems. All I'm saying here is that remittance is an important determinant of the weight share. Now, if you have a flexible system and you have lots of remittance inflow, this will appreciate your exchange rate, and therefore that will increase your weight share because this would fall. In a fixed exchange rate system, therefore that remittances will affect weight share only through the labor supply uh, channel. But this is on, the exchange rate channel is unlikely to be important. We know most countries have a managed float or fixed exchange rate system, so that remittances will be only important to the labor supply channel. Now, the basic story, if you pick up any, any, any work on the determinants of the wage share, they'll talk about class struggle, they'll talk about the degree of monopoly via the markups, they'll talk about aggregate prices, they'll talk about foreign exchange rate, etc. What I'm trying to say now, in addition to all these, is that remittances and to the labor supply decision, whether work or leisure, have an important role in determining the functional income distribution. Now, I haven't seen any theoretical piece that tries to connect inequality, sorry, remittances with inequality generally, much as in remittances and the functional income distribution. Now, there is some empirical work in that, but even that is thin. Now, I want to connect this remittance story, this distribution story, to growth. Yeah? Now, for simplicity, let's keep this very simple. So we have the wage share here. So in, this was the this is the last one we saw. We're just going to ignore all these intermediate inputs, etc., and the exchange rate movements. So the basic level, wage share is a positive function of hours work, labor productivity, and inversely related to level economic activity, and and the markup. Why is inversely related to level economic activity? I did that in the paper, so we can discuss that perhaps uh, in the Q and A. Now, if you were to log this with respect to time, we see that this is the rate of change here, of the wage share, all right? Now, um, I, I specify the rate of change of hours worked as this here. So what we're seeing here, the, this V is, is uh, non-labor income remittances, and this, this parameter here, I think it's gamma. Can you see that clearly? This, this parameter gamma represents the preference for, for, for leisure. In this case, leisure is an inferior good with this parameter. This parameter represents leisure as a normal good. So that if, le if the preference for leisure exceeds the preference, sorry, if leisure is an inferior good, if this preference exceeds the preference for leisure as a normal good, then we can see increases in our work. Is that clear? I'll repeat that. So this represents the preference, meaning leisure in this case is an inferior good. That's what this, that's what this parameter represents. This parameter says that leisure is a normal good. If this exceeds this, therefore hours work must expand. 
right? Now, after some substitution, that's what this becomes. Now, we need to specify the rate of change of non-labor income, or in this case, remittances. So, I'm saying that the rate, the rate of change of remittances has to do with an altruism parameter, beta. So, as altruism expands for our family or friends abroad, we expect the rate of remittance inflow to expand. Now, this says that remittances will, will increase, remittance inflow will increase. If the target wage share exceeds the actual wage share, in other words, what labor bargained for they did not get. So the, the expectations were not met, the target were not met, and in, these, in this case, we, we can assume that family will send more money abroad. All right? Now, the target profit, the target wage share is one minus the target profit share. And this is how we define the target profit share. In this case, all this is saying is, as hours work increases, or as employment increases, the bargaining power of the firm declines. That's all this says. Now, through some substitution, we get this as the final equation. So now we have two differential equations. I'm calling this here the wage shear curve. All right? Any point along this curve, the rate of change of wage shear is equal to zero. This I call the remittances curve. Any point, these, these terms might, might be changed later in the paper. Yeah? Um, this remittance curve here, any point along this curve, the rate of change of remittances is equal to zero. Right? So where they intersect, we have that, that, that dynamic equilibrium. Now, the wage share curve can either be upward sloping or downward sloping. It will be downward sloping if this exceeds this. And in that case, leisure is an inferior good. If it's upward sloping, it means leisure is a normal good. The remittance curve is always downward sloping. And then it looks something like this. So in this case, leisure is an inferior good. In this case, leisure is a normal good. This is a basic IS curve, which we specified earlier for wage-led economy. All right? So simple exercise. Let's assume the altruism parameter expands all right, or increases so that there's increase in remittance inflows. So, so let's say in this case, leisure is an inferior good. Eh? So that remittances expands. Given that leisure is an inferior good, hours work will increase. Either hours work in wage employment or time spent in self-employment. In that case, with an increase in remittances, wage share rises. Now, with an increase in the wage share in a small open economy, where in the open case in a small open economy, you have uh, a profit-led dynamic, meaning the increase in the wage share for a small open economy reduces price competitiveness. So with remittance inflow and higher wage share, we get a shift to the left, to, to the left in the IS curve at a lower level of capacity utilization or lower growth if you have. So we can observe remittance inflow with higher wage share, surely a good thing, but poor economic performance. And this is surely, this is, this is the outcome of the preferences of workers in this given economy, where the preference for work is, is over leisure. If you have leisure as a normal good, with an increase in remittances from R, RC2 to RC3, what we see is a decline in the wage share from, from alpha O to alpha 3. Now, in a small open economy with, with, with lower wage share, external price competitiveness might be increased, and this can shift the IS curve outwards. So in this case, we have remittance inflow being growth intensive, and that has to do with leisure. Sure, with leisure being uh, a normal good. The, set, the point of this story is that if a given economy or a group of countries, leisure is a normal good and is a major recipient of remittances, you might find endemic or structural inequality, so to speak, or at least low wage shares, even though you might experience economic growth. So, you, so what we, and this is, this is consistent with, with the evidence of the past three, de three decades, meaning you have economic growth, but rising inequality. In this case, I'm talking about wage shares. And as, as explained earlier, this can translate into personal inequality. So as wage shares fall, we can expect top incomes to rise and so forth. What's the, what's the policy bang of this? We need, to, we, we need to change preferences in a sense. If a given group of countries 
going to be major recipients of uh, remittances because of migration flows and so forth, and we expect that to occur in the foreseeable future, then we want, we want to be in this equilibrium where remittances inflow increase the wage share. Now, I recommend to increase the cost of leisure, the opportunity cost of leisure must rise, and therefore we can experiment with higher uh, minimum wages if we try to reduce labor market discrimination. Remittances in, in countries with ethnic conflict or poor societies, remittances can be an escape valve from the labor market. All right? So if we can eliminate, labor, if we can reduce uh, labor market discrimination, it might incentivize uh, people to work even with remittance inflow. I suggest in the paper to experiment with national internships at the high school level to create a work ethic. Yeah? And the production diversification story addresses the second problem. So even if we were to deal with the work ethic problem, meaning with remittance inflow, we still work and therefore we share rise, how do we deal with the decline in economic performance? Now this decline in economic performance in the paper is, is largely the outcome of a limited production base or a limited export portfolio. All right? Now, with remittance inflow, much of this or much of this increase in wage share is spent on consumer uh, durables, which are largely imported, and this tend to reduce your economic performance. So, I recommend for that uh, production diversification. We can discuss briefly what that means uh, in the Q and A. I'm going to end it there. Thanks. Thank you.